Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. Today, it's all about growing up. Please don't do that. We all have to. We have two stories on the subject, and I think you're going to like them. Also, we have a request from Courtney that I was more than happy to fill. Add in a special super secret guest that is, well... Amazing! Yep, you got it. So, why not learn something and begin with this five-minute mystery? Another five-minute mystery! This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by... Please don't press that button. How many times have we heard it before? This story shows us why you should never press that button. Just don't do it. Yes, this was a community service bulletin of a sort. And so Johnny Raymond and his organ bring to a close the first program of his new radio series. This is your announcer, James Van Dorn, saying good night to you all. That's better. Now, Mr. Horton, you're the director of this show. Would you tell me in your own words exactly what happened when Van Dorn died? Well, Inspector, it was toward the end of the program. Van Dorn reached for the button to put the studio off the air, and then he, he just gasped and fell to the floor. I see. Where were the rest of you when this happened? Well, Taylor and I were in the control room, and Johnny Raymond was at the organ. Are you Taylor? That's right. I'm the studio engineer. Did you notice anything peculiar during the program? Mm, no, sir. I was in the control room most of the time. Most of the time? Well... Except for the few minutes when I went into the studio to check the equipment just before going on the air. You noticed nothing out of the ordinary? No, sir. How about you, Raymond? Well, I was at the organ singing during the whole show. And you didn't see anything either? No. Mr. Van Dorn just pushed the button and then collapsed. Let's take a look at this button. Yeah. Which one was it, Mr. Raymond? Well, I wouldn't know. Kind of new around here. It's this black one here, Inspector. It puts the studio off the air when you... Oh! Yeah, what's a... What happened, Mr. Horton? Well, I don't know. Something pierced my finger. Pierced your finger? Yeah, let me see. Well, well, well what do you know about this? What is hey, look here. A little pin sticking out of this button. A little pin? Yes, what? and that's not all. Do you see this stain on the lower half of this pin? If my guess is right, this pin's been dipped in poison. Dipped but in what poison. does it mean? It means that Van Dorn didn't just die, but was murdered. Murdered? But how? Simple. When Van Dorn went to switch the studio off the air... He stuck his finger on the pin and died immediately. Incredible. But that means anyone could have slipped in here and put that pin there. Hey, you're wrong there, Mr. Horton. It means that one of you three put that pin there. One of us? Yes, Horton. Who? You, Mr. Taylor. You're under arrest for the murder of James Van Dorn. How did the inspector know it was Taylor who murdered Van Dorn? We'll give you the solution in just a moment. But first... told you that you should never press the button. As FFMs go, this one wasn't too bad. However, there was one glowing problem. Why didn't Mr. Horton die when he pressed the button? Even the detective noted the stain on the pin used. I guess it could have been wiped clean. Let's go find out. And now for the solution. I murdered Van Dorn. Why, you're crazy. Am I? You said you went out to check all the equipment. If someone else had put the pin on that button, you would have noticed it. Well, one of the others could... No, Taylor. It couldn't have been Raymond or Horton. Raymond's new in the radio business and knew nothing about the board or anything else about this studio. Remember, 
This was his first radio show. If it had been Horton, he wouldn't have accidentally stuck his finger on it just now. No, Taylor. You were the only possible one. Now, you'd better get ready to march. We're going to headquarters. <laughs> Okay, the mystery remains as to why Horton didn't fall dead as well. The good news is that the logic is sound. Now all the detective has to do is find the motive and the opportunity. Good show, though. This 5-Minute Mystery was brought to you by... Please, don't press the button. Those of you that follow the blog already know that we have a special guest on today's program. But who it is has been a big secret until now. So what do I have to say this week? Just this. Every once in a while, I like to give credit where credit is due and publicly thank Mr. Kevin McLeod. Kevin is an American composer and musician. He has composed thousands of pieces of royalty-free music and made them available under a Creative Commons copyright license. Kevin not only has provided at least 80% of the music you hear on Ron's Amazing Stories, but I also consider him a friend. Now, wouldn't it be neat if we could talk to Kevin for a couple minutes to thank him personally? Well. I want to welcome to the podcast, Mr. Kevin McLeod. Hello, hello. And so I see somebody's been reading Wikipedia. <laughs> yes, I have, actually. <laughs> Some of it was me. Some of it was me. Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't think Wikipedia mentions your uh, your show at all. No, they so don't. So you need to fix that. Uh, you know, I don't know how to do that. One of these days. I don't, I don't either. I think you just ask. <laughs> you have enough listeners that you just say, hey, does somebody out there uh, edit Wikipedia? Because uh, I need to get my uh, show listed on Kevin's, uh, on pe- Kevin's page. Yeah. Well, I will do that. Now, I got a little bit of history trivia for you. When do you think it was the first time you appeared on the podcast? Um, I'm going to say June uh, 2018. Nope. The first I, time. Oh, I've been here before. All right. Oh, you have. The very first time you were on the podcast was October 10th, 2011. Oh, my. And I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah. And so on the previous. Still po- doing the show. This yeah. is nice. Isn't that nifty? And here's another piece of trivia for you. The very first episode of uh, Ron's Amazing Stories featured your hit song, Consistency Part 2. Oh, all right. Which, to this day, is the closing tune for the show. Now that, I think, is amazing. I'm happy to be a part of a cultural phenomenon, right? (laughs) What do you think about that? It's been a long time, Kevin, and I gotta say, I know I'm gushing, but I can't say how much I appreciate you, not only for what you do, but the quality of what you do. And I get all the times I get email asking me, where do I get my music, number one, and yeah. who, who does it? And I'm proud to say it's Kevin McLeod, for the most part. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't do everything. Can't be everywhere. But yeah, thank you so well. And, you know, it's, it's shows like this that help get my music out in front of people, so... It's a, it's a it's a weird symbiotic relationship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, now I'm gushing. <laughs> is it safe to say that... No, nah, I'm going to just put it out there. Is it safe to say that you are the king of YouTube? People have called me that. Is it safe <laughs> to say that? I don't know what would make it unsafe. I don't know if PewDiePie has a death squad out there that's going <laughs> to track people down or what. Well, I tell uh, yeah, you, no, I hear your uh, music there a lot. I am there a lot. I mean, it's not. I mean, I, I've got a bunch of stuff on on my website, and then I've also, I, I'm like a third, or I used to be a third of the YouTube uh, audio library catalog. You get it from music from YouTube, and it's certified safe to use. So there's a thing out there where you can get YouTube safe music from YouTube. 
And you're there too? I'm in there too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then to find out you just, you're also one of the top video game music providers, are you not? Um, I certainly do write a lot of music for video games. <laughs> Well, and a lot of people use my music for like casual video games, you know, iOS and Android kind of phone games. I mean, all thousands and thousands of those. Well, I was on your site today and I saw something that I was intrigued by. What can you tell us about Beat Saber? Oh, Beat Saber, the greatest video game in the history of video games? That? <laughs> That's the one, yeah. So Beat Saber is a, it's a virtual reality video game. It's kind of uh, like Dance Dance Revolution with lightsabers. So it's like a rhythm game where you're slicing these things. It's kind of it's kind of like Fruit Ninja, but to music. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's amazing. It's an amazing game. I love this game. Mm-hmm. The game ships with like 10 tracks, which are very well put together and good good level design and all that. But there's a huge modding community out there for this game, which is not even in full release yet. I think it's still an alpha release. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's <laughs> not even a full video game, but it's available in a bunch of places. But then I'm like, well, instead of just making levels that meet you know, particular songs, like you would for like Guitar Hero or something like that, or Rock Band, why don't I write songs that are fun to do Beat Saber to and then do those things? And so I've recently been writing some music specifically for Beat Saber. I've uh, been working with a, um, a guy out of uh, Perth who is a very good level charter, I believe we, they call them, a, a person who creates the charts of the game. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, yeah, I just posted like my own feeble attempt at a at a thing, but I've got I've got more in the hopper, professionally designed levels and it, it's it's such a good game. Everyone should play this. I I'm intrigued. I I have I don't know if I even have the equipment to play it, but Yeah. Why don't I play just a little bit of the, your most recent piece for Beat Saber? All right. That looks intriguing. And and if you go to Kevin's website, you can see that set to a video where someone is actually playing it. And you can see how it works. With each strike of the of the saber, a beat sounds, basically. Yeah. And if you get it right, <laughs> you move <laughs> on. If you don't, I, I'm guessing it you fall apart. <laughs> yeah, I know. It'll, it'll, if you get too many wrong in a row, it'll stop you. That is me playing, and you can tell because I'm not that good. Oh. <laughs> I, yeah, that's me playing. I love the game, but man, am I not good at it? You see videos of people online, you're like, I don't know, I don't. I wow, man, you like they either practiced a lot. More. No, it's not people who practiced a lot more because like there are some people who come over to the house and they're like automatically better than me the first time they're in. So <laughs> it's not practice. It's there's there's something that I'm missing. Well, it it looks like an, a total great time just waiting to happen and oh you gotta you gotta <laughs> play it you gotta play it it is so good i think i don't know if it's out there for the ps4 i know it's out for htc vive it might be out for oculus too i don't know yeah it looked like you had to have actual uh, headset on to play it but yep. uh i don't know it just looks like a world of fun now i was oh, recently at the mall, they were uh, showcasing this brand new thing that where you go in and you put, strap on a headset and you get to play all these incredible games. And yeah. I got to play one that um, was kind of a, if you can imagine an old ghost town and you're being attacked by ghosts. And this thing was so amazing that I'm sitting there and I got pretty good at drawing my gun and blasting these ghosts out of the air. 
I think that, that this type of game is the wave of the future. I just I just absolutely am enthralled. Yeah, they're a, they're a lot of fun. I, I also use VR. Like these short, energetic, very cool games are great. And I also, I just like watching movies in VR. I've got a couple of apps where you're just like sitting in a cinema. Oh, yeah? And yeah, and then you're just watching it on the big screen. And you don't notice how much that changes a movie because like if you're sitting in your living room, like you sort of your eyes converge like roughly right in front of you, wherever your television is. Mm -hmm. But at a movie theater, your eyes are able to diverge and look very far into the distance. And it's the same thing with VR. Really? The yeah, it's it uh, lessens viewing fatigue for me. Hmm. And uh, yeah, and you get to hang out. You get to hang out in movie theater sometimes with other people, sometimes without. It's it's it is an excellent experience. Well, you know, I have what I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I have a cardboard box. Is that something I could do with that? Probably, I don't know. That's the Google cardboard box thing. Yeah, if 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 they've got movie viewers, I'm gonna yeah, have the, to try that. The, the, the ones on Windows is just whatever like you know MP4s you have on your hard drive. It'll just play them. Really? Or it'll it'll play or or it'll play stuff from Netflix or from uh, YouTube directly. It is a good experience. The downside is it's a one person experience. Yeah. So if you've got somebody else over at the house, you're not both going to be watching in the theater. <laughs> I think that's coming in the future, probably at some date down the line. <laughs> oh yeah, there's there's no doubt because right now it costs what like five thousand dollars to have a decent VR setup. Yeah. Yeah, that's what and, I've heard. Uh, uh, I've heard the PS4 isn't bad if you get their helmet. It's like five hundred dollars. Yep. So when, plus the cost of the PS4 itself too, of course. Right. So then you're probably up to nine hundred or so. Right. Huh. Well, that gives me something to look forward to. I'm going to go try that yeah. with my cardboard box. Yeah. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but that's what Google calls it—the cardboard box. Yeah. So, Kevin, have you got some music for us that? You could play that we could play today, something that you can share with us. Do you want to be happy? I do want to be happy because <laughs> that's all I have. Yeah, no, I just published uh, two new pieces over to uh, freepd. Freepd. Freepd.com, my new passion website. Okay, well, tell us about that. Oh, um, yeah, if you like the ease of use of Incompetech, but it wasn't quite easy enough or free enough um i've got a new website which is simpler easier and freer and it uh it, there's more than just me there's a few composers there but everything is as public domain as we can make it as public domain as can be permitted by law really so you know yeah. you know to me that means that i can take this cut it up put it on an album and put it out yep. there and sell it yeah you can Wow, that's public domain. <laughs> yep, you could take the entire catalog of the thing, start up your own competing website, and then sell that to people. Oh, I wouldn't do that. That would be wrong. I, why, why would that be wrong? It's totally legit. <laughs> Go ahead, do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But I'll tell you what, I will put a link to this site on the show notes so people can go yeah. over and take a look at it. So all of the music there is completely free. There's no need to even give you credit you don't for need it? To credit you don't need to do anything and it's resaleable and youtube isn't going to send me a nasty note saying take it down <laughs> well i hope not uh they shouldn't they shouldn't all right well i'm gonna pick this first one i think i'm gonna i'll play two i think and i think right. i'm the first one i'm gonna pick is pickled pink what can you tell us about that one Oh, this is so. I was on a uh, a video call with the uh, two other composers that I'm that I'm uh, in co cahoots with on this website, and and we we're discussing. It's like, all right, what? Where is the catalog week here? Where do we need to put in some more things? And everyone was agreed that it needs more ukulele. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> Ah, all right, I'll fall on that sword. And so uh, this is me writing uh, very, very happy ukulele music. And are you, now I've got to ask, is that you actually playing a ukulele or is it an instrument for us? Oh, created? yeah, no, that that is a virtual ukulele. That okay. is not a real instrument. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, there, I, was... I mean, there are real instruments in, in and around these, but not the, the ukulele is not real. 
Well, I noticed uh, someone named Raphael Crooks right below you has yeah. happy whistling ukulele. Oh, I betcha. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that we can expect is everything and anything on this new site called freepd.com. Yep. Freepd.com. Yeah, there's. If you can't find something happy enough, we've done something wrong. But I mean, there's also horror music in there. There's Norwegian death metal, which is fantastic. Norwegian death metal. Oh, from an actual Norwegian. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> I'm going to have to find that. Well, I'm looking at some of the categories. You've got update, positive, motivational. You've got world. You've got epic, dramatic, progression, underscoring, horror, electronic, romantic, miscellaneous, comedy, and then something called scraps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't don't ever go there. The, the, the scrap stuff was uh, made for backward compatibility. There's uh, the, the casual person's not going to need anything in there. But yeah, you want to look into miscellaneous because there's some amazing stuff under the miscellaneous one. <laughs> All right. Well, I am going to spend some time here myself. I, I'm going to see if there's some music here I can find. Definitely ukulele-ish. That is, that's, yeah. And happy. Oh, yeah. It's making me smile as I hear it. It's like a summer day in France, you know? You know what I could see using this for? It's kind of an introduction to a story that we might have on the show. You know, yeah. just kind of a, we're going to go to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood type thing. Yeah, there, there is no end. There is no limit to the upbeat, positive, corporate, motivational genre. You can, you can, you can sell medications to this stuff. You can, yeah, you can, you can set up your uh, parent-teacher association con uh, meeting to this. It's completely boundless. I love it. And I'm going to do that. I am going to figure out something to do with Pickled Pink. Make it work in Ron's Amazing Stories. I yep, know you would can. be the you you would be the first one to make it iconic because it just <laughs> published. You just published it. Just so, published, yeah, so, like yesterday. Is this a world debut? Yeah, ab absolutely. <laughs> All right, you heard it here, folks. You yeah. just heard the world debut of Pickled Pink. Thank you, Kevin McLeod. Absolutely, thank you. Well, Kevin, I want to thank you for taking a few minutes to talk to us. You are always a pleasure and always a joy. Ah. <laughs> Why don't you give us some more websites so that the listeners out there can find you and hear more music like Pickled Pink? Oh, yeah. Well, freepd.com, that's, you know, it's got a 150, very high quality, very easy to get at things. Go go after that one first. Incompetech.com. If you want to see to hear my back catalog of the last I don't know 15 years of my work, that's all there. Um, Incompetech. How do you spell that? Doesn't matter. Just Google for graph paper. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. Then, and then it'll show up. You know, I've always wanted to ask you about the graph paper part of Incompetech. Well, I'm sorry, this interview isn't at an end. We'll have to wait till <laughs> next time. <laughs> Okay, I think that's fair. <laughs> I'll talk about all the graph paper goodness. Well, th Kevin, I want to thank you for taking a few minutes with us. You are the best. Thank you so much for having me. And that is Incompetech.com, and he was Kevin McLeod. Now that was a whole lot of fun. Kevin is a heck of a great guy and is talented to boot. I want to thank him for taking the time, and if you missed any of the links that he talked about, they will all be in the show notes. Thank you, Kevin. And now, these are your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. It 
amazes me how many stories you guys have. I love them so much and appreciate every one. This time we have two wonderful stories that are not paranormal, scary, or even a head scratcher. They are about growing up. Our first comes from our great friend in Germany who's listening to this right now. Tom, you are an amazing guy and here is your story. Hello, Ron. In your last podcast and others, you mentioned certain instances of growing up. It brought up my memories of growing up in the South. On the Gulf of New Mexico, the summers are very hot, and as I look back, I don't know how we withstood those 90-degree days without an air conditioner. Well, we did have an oscillating fan that cooled us down as we slept. My mother would often warn my cousin Fred to stop sticking his fingers into the fan, trying to see if he could stop its rotation. By the way, he still has all his fingers. Another way to beat the heat was playing in my grandmother's yard and cooling down with the garden hose. Being a tropical climate, many days were accompanied with hard rain. These cooled everything off, if only for a few minutes. It may sound strange by today's standards, but we actually ran through the rain-filled ditches in delight till about an hour later when they were empty and once again dry as a bone, making it impossible to cross a paved road without burning the soles of your feet. We were never allowed to play inside. Get out from under my skirt, was often said by the lady of the house. Go outside and be back in time for supper. That was the evening meal in the South. Oh, and if a car comes, get off the street. No one ever asked where we were going, and we were told to stay out of trouble. We knew that if we got into trouble, the word always got home before we did. Ron, you said you spent your time in the woods. Well, our time was spent in the swamp and at the branch. In the South, when you're playing outside, you were constantly reminded to keep an eye out for snakes and was told, let us know if you see one. We would go out for the whole day and would cut sugarcane stalks into sections to take along in case we got hungry or thirsty. As we would go through the local farmer's fields, we sometimes helped ourselves to one of hundreds of watermelons, which were better than candy to us. We didn't have any entertainment except each other and double feature movies on the weekends. The movie houses had those great air conditioners for comfort and the best popcorn in the world. After a good horror movie, we would challenge each other to take the shortcut through the old cemetery. It was in the middle of the town and was completely filled with so many deaths due to the yellow fever outbreaks. Typical southern grave sites were above ground and had marble tops. In those hot summer days, we would go to the cemetery and lay on top of the cool marble slabs and watch the Spanish moss sway in the breeze among the old oaks. In those days, entertainment was mostly radio programs and movies on the weekends. Radio in the South was almost always country music, gospel, and from a long distance away in New Orleans, we got to hear Dixieland jazz. I remember one day I was entering the movie theater and a new sound came over the screen. It was a group called Bill Haley and the Comets. They were playing Rock Around the Clock. Wow, I thought, what is this? It seemed like the sky opened and the sun shone into that darkened theater. Well, Ron, that is my childhood story. Yours truly, Tom. That was incredible, Tom. Amazing just does not seem to capture it. I love stories, and getting them like this means that people can know what it was really like way back when. I know that Bill Haley began in 1952, so that kind of sets the date for us. This is an amazing look into the distant past and what sounds like a marvelous time. Thank you, Tom, for sharing your story. 
Our next story is another growing up tale. It also begins with an introduction that I feel compelled to read. It's from Vanessa Fiore in Dayton Beach, Florida. Ron, you are amazing. I hope you're not too proud to read this part if you read my story on the show. What you do is a service to us all, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. Each week, you ask us to send you stories. I hope we do that for you. We need to support Ron's amazing story. My story may not be that exciting, scary, or suspenseful, but I hope you like it. I turned 12 in the fall of 1989. One of my biggest obsessions at the time was a collegiate sitcom, A Different World, though most of its co-ed content sailed over my pre-adolescent head. To me, the show represented the fun and freedom of leaving the nest. It was everything I imagined my 19-year-old sister was enjoying while she was away at college. So you can imagine my excitement when I was invited to get a first-hand glimpse of that fantasy. My parents agreed to drive me up to her campus for a weekend visit. I don't recall who devised this plan, but if you knew my family, you know that this was an unusual turn of events. My sister and I are like day and night, and our age gap didn't help matters. She was often forced to let me tag along, and we even had to share a room. What team wants to be burdened with a pesky grade schooler? While she was in high school, we spoke only in threats. Me threatening to snitch, and her threatening me with swift, painful retribution, if I did. To visit her in her new sophomore digs offered the possibility of turning over a new leaf. When I arrived, I found the warm, nurturing sister I never got to see when I was getting the remote ripped out of my hands or having the bathroom door slammed on my face. We toured all her favorite local haunts, and I marveled at the pub where she worked, a cool kid hangout plucked right out of a John Hughes film. We stopped by a quirky gift shop where I bought a pair of delicate golden spiral earrings that I still wear to this day. I got cozy in the rental flat that she shared with her roommate. It may have been all shabby and no chic, but it still smacked of grown-up glamour to me. I watched TV well past my bedtime. She let me pig out on sugary cereals, which was forbidden back home, and we laughed out loud when we both discovered that Cookie Crisp was actually gross. More importantly, I spent time confiding in my sister rather than conspiring against her. It was a dream come true, and then it was over. During that one special weekend, I got to be Freddie Brooks, floating through a whimsical daydream that looked nothing like my boring, sheltered daily life. For a few months after that visit, my sister sent me little care packages a heart toting teddy bear on Valentine's Day, or a cute knick-knack just because. That habit dried up before too long, but I still look back oh so fondly on that one time when we successfully hit the reset button. I'm now 41 years old, and today my sister and I are quite close. We both have nearly grown kids, and in fact I am about to send my eldest girl to college. I have a feeling that she's in for the time of her life, and I can't wait to see what she becomes. Vanessa from Dayton Beach, Florida Well, Vanessa, I did read your intro, and I want to thank you for the kind words. I do this podcast for people, and it means a lot to hear that you appreciate it. You're right, your story isn't exciting or suspenseful, but it is heartfelt. Thank you for sharing it, and I wish your daughter well at school. My niece Sarah is just about to start that very same journey at Western Washington University, and we too are so very proud of her. If you want to hear your story on Ron's Amazing Stories, it's really easy to do. 
Just head to the main website, click on the story submission banner, and lo and behold, everything you need to know is there for you. Now I'm starting a new project here at the podcast, and I got a question for you. How would you like to write a fiction story for the podcast? That's right, a story doesn't have to be true to be good. Here's the idea. I will give you a concept, and you run with it. I will even help you edit your story and make it the best that it can be. When we're all done, you send it back and whiz bang boom, I will read your work, or you will, on the show. If you think this sounds like something you want to try, head to ronsamazingstories.com and contact me. We have had someone take the challenge, and I can't wait to see where it leads. While we were talking with Kevin earlier, he mentioned that on his site, freepd.com, there was a certain piece of music he rather liked. I just had to track down what I think must be that Norwegian death metal piece he spoke of. It was written by Alexander Nakarada, who is a full-blood Viking from the cold north, a.k.a. Norway. At some point during his teenage years, he realized that instead of raiding and plundering, he wanted to compose music. The chieftain then banned him from the village, and he moved to the countryside to fulfill his dream. He named this tune Construction, and I hope that you enjoy it.
pretty good. If you want to hear more music from Kevin McLeod or Alexander, head to freepd.com. I've played around with the site now, and there is anything you can imagine, and it's completely free. Thank you, Kevin. As read by Amazing Stories, read by Amazing People. This time on As Read By, we have a story suggestion sent in by listener Courtney Johnson. Here is her email. Hey Ron, my husband and I love your podcast. We found it a few weeks ago and have listened to at least 30 of them now. I see that you have over 300 available, so we've got a lot of work to do. I am not a writer, but I do want to tell you about a story that I've always loved. I first heard it in the fifth grade. My teacher would read us a story each week from a book called 50 Famous People by James Baldwin. This is a collection of short stories about people, some more famous than others. They are not strictly biographical, but there is truth in each one of them. Each story is an ethical lesson. My favorite was The Caliph and the Gardener. I tried to record it myself reading it, and it came out really bad. I would love for you to tell this story. Courtney from Long Island, New York. Well, Courtney, it took a bit of research, but I found both your book and story. Both are in the public domain, but just barely. The book was published in 1912, which means the copyright ran out in 2012. The whole text of the book is available for a free download at Google Books. I was ready to read your story, but then I decided to check to see if it was available as an audiobook on LibriVox.org. The entire book is not, but your story, The Caliph and the Gardener, was. And what a great story it is. Here is your request, as read for us by Dale Grothman. The Caliph and the Gardener, from 50 Famous People, a book of short stories by James Baldwin. There was once a Caliph of Cordoba, whose name was Al-Mansur. One day a strange merchant came to him with some diamonds and pearls, which he had brought from beyond the sea. The caliph was so pleased with these jewels that he bought them, and paid the merchant a large sum of money. The merchant put the gold in a bag of purple silk which he tied to his belt underneath his long cloak. Then he set out on foot to walk to another city. It was midsummer, and the day was very hot. As the merchant was walking along, he came to a river that flowed gently between green and shady banks. He was hot and covered with dust. No one was near. Very few people ever came that way. Why should he not cool himself in the refreshing water? He took off his clothes and laid them on the bank. He put the bag of money on top of them and leapt into the water. How cool and delicious it was! Suddenly he heard a rustling noise behind him. He turned quickly and saw an eagle rising into the air with his money bag in its claws. No doubt the bird had mistaken the purple silk for something good to eat. The merchant shouted. He jumped out of the water and shouted again. But it was no use. The great bird was high in the air and flying toward the far-off mountains with all his money. The poor man could do nothing but dress himself and go sorrowing on his way. A year passed by, and then the merchant appeared once more before Al-Mansur. O Caliph, he said, here are a few jewels which I had reserved as a present for my wife, but I have met with such bad luck that I am forced to sell them. I pray that you will look at them and take them at your own price. Al-Mansur noticed that the merchant was very sad and downcast. Why, what has happened to you? he asked. Have you been sick? Then the merchant told him how the eagle had flown off with his money. Why didn't you come to us before? he asked. We might have done something to help you. 
Toward what place was the eagle flying when you last saw it? It was flying toward the Black Mountains, answered the merchant. The next morning the caliph called ten of his officers before him. Ride at once to the Black Mountains, he said. Find all the old men that live on the mountains or in the flat country around, and command them to appear before me one week from today. The officers did as they were bidden. On the day appointed, forty gray-bearded, honest old men stood before the caliph. All were asked the same question. Do you know of any person who was once poor, but who has lately and suddenly become well-to-do? Most of the old men answered that they did not know of any such person. A few said that there was one man in their neighborhood who seemed to have had some sort of good luck. This man was a gardener. A year before, he was so poor that he had scarcely clothes for his back. His children were crying for food. But lately, everything had changed for him. Both he and his family dressed well. They had plenty to eat, and he had even bought a horse to help him carry his produce to market. The caliph at once gave orders for the gardener to be brought before him the next day. He also ordered that the merchant should come at the same time. Before noon the next day, the gardener was admitted to the palace. As soon as he entered the hall, the caliph went to meet him. Good friend, he said, if you should find something that we had lost, what would you do with it? The gardener put his hands under his cloak and drew out the very bag that the merchant had lost. Here it is, my lord, he said. At the sight of his lost treasure, the merchant began to dance and shout for joy. Tell us, said Al-Mansur to the gardener, tell us how you came to find that bag. The gardener answered, A year ago I was spading in my garden. I saw something fall at the foot of a palm tree. I ran to pick it up, and was surprised to find that it was a bag full of bright gold pieces. I said to myself, This money must belong to our master, Al-Mansur. Some large bird has stolen it from his palace. Well then, said the caliph, why did you not return it to us at once? It was this way, said the gardener. I looked at the gold pieces, and then thought of my own great necessities. My wife and children were suffering for want of food and clothing. I had no shoes for my feet, no coat for my back. So I said to myself, My lord Al-Mansur is famous for his kindness to the poor. He will not care. So I took ten gold pieces from the many that were in the bag. I meant only to borrow them, and I put the bag in a safe place, saying that as soon as I could replace the ten pieces, I would return all to my lord Al-Mansur. With much hard labor and careful management, I have saved only five little silver pieces. But, as I came to your palace this morning, I kept saying to myself, when our lord Al-Mansur learns just how it was that I borrowed the gold, I have no doubt that in his kindness of heart he will forgive me the debt. Great was the caliph's surprise when he heard the poor man's story. He took the bag of money and handed it to the merchant. Take the bag and count the money that is in it, he said. If anything is lacking, I will pay it to you. The merchant did as he was told. There is nothing lacking, he said, but the ten pieces he has told you about, and I will give him those as a reward. No, said Al-Mansur, it is for me to reward the man as he deserves. Saying this, he ordered that ten gold pieces be given to the merchant in the place of those that were lacking. Then he rewarded the gardener with ten more pieces for his honesty. Your debt is paid. Think no more about it, he said. End of The Caliph and the Gardener by James Baldwin I want to thank you, Courtney, for requesting this one. What a great and wonderful tale. The author, James Baldwin, was born in Indiana and made a career as an educator and administrator. He served as the superintendent of the Indiana school system for 18 years and then went on to become a widely published textbook and children's author. 
He was the editor and contributor to the Baldwin Readers in 1897, the Harper Readers in 1898, and the Expressive Readers in 1911. He wrote over 30 books about famous people in history and retold their classic stories. In all, he wrote more than 50 books, the most famous of which included 50 Famous Stories Retold in 1896, and then Abraham Lincoln, A True Life in 1904. How about that? On the podcast next week, we will have a Western Roundup with tales from you guys and an excellent Gunsmoke story. I want to thank Kevin McLeod, Tom Williams, Vanessa Fiore, and Courtney Johnson for your contributions this week. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, it's so easy to do. Just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There, you will find all the links you're going to need. We are on Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many other services. So pick one and do leave some feedback about the show. It really does help us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.